from now on, we really plunge into the depth. We're on the 13th verse of, of the third chapter of Mormon. And what a powerful statement this is, you notice. My joy was vain. Remember, he thought they would become righteous because they were sorrowing. But you know, they would become righteous, that didn't work at all. It was not, their sorrowing was not unto repentance because of the goodness of God, but rather the sorrowing of the damned because the Lord would not always suffer them to take happiness in sin. We know the stock market has crashed numbers of times, but do we learn anything from it? Do we repent at all, anything like that? There is this tragic situation of no repentance, no disavowal of misbehavior or anything like that when, when crimes are committed. And uh, we've done no wrong, we've made mistakes, we've had bad advice, we've been misinformed, uh, we've done it all for the good of this, that, and the other. But no one ever really admits that we have been in a state of awful wickedness, and that's what brings it up. The classic example of this we have with us now, we never knew such a perfect case would exist as what we do have now. What does this fit perfectly? The sorrowing of the damned. Sorrow for their sins, what they have done, what's brought this on them? No. But because the Lord wouldn't always suffer them to take happiness in sin. What's the attitude of people with AIDS? They sorrow, they suffer, they want a cure, they have to do something, they have to be saved and so forth. But never do they show any inclination to repent of what brought the thing on. And never, if we had only had the cure, then they could continue in their own ways and, and, and feel happy about it. And they sort of re resent being unable to do that. So this is a peculiar case in which this applies all the way. They sorrow, but it's the sorrow of the damned, and they sorrow just for one reason, that they can't go on doing the very thing that's brought them into this terrible path. If they had a chance, they'd go right on doing it forever. Well, the Lord must call a halt here sometime. So now he's going to do it. And so in the next verse, we have... Another psychological note to notice, they did curse God and wish to die, nevertheless they would struggle with the sword for their lives. There's another one, you see. What should we have, says Hitler, a Schrecken ohne Ende or Schrecklichkeit ohne Ende? A, a terror without end or a terrible end? We have, the, we have the choice of a terrible end or a terror without end. That's the situation they live with, they'll go on struggling to the last ditch. But they got both. They got both the terrible ending and the terror without end. And the reason was that they were beyond repentance, as we read in the next verse. This is even more horrible. Notice the mounting, the mounting despair here. Now, this is the question we have to ask as you read the Book of Mormon here. Does this have to be? We see it's happening. Does it have to happen with us? Remember, this comes to you, O you Gentiles, that you may be wiser than we have been. And now these things are happening just exactly in the in, in the grim declension in which we see them occurring today. And so, this horrible thing is said here now, that the Lord should ever withdraw his grace. I saw that the day of grace was passed with them. Here is 80. You see, that's what 80 is, the, the point of no return. You know about the four stages in, in that tragedy that I mentioned by Sophocles and Euripides. Well, and that's because, as a matter of fact, the four stages are, are uh, Olbia, and chorus, and <laughs> hubris, and eighty. Olbia is when you're prosper, you're prosperous, and you have everything, and you're living a happy life. That's happiness. And then, with that, you go on and you get full. Today, overweight is our main problem. We eat when we're not hungry, we drink when we're not thirsty, and that's small pleasure. See, we just talked about that in the fasting, where during the in fourth Nephi, when they lived as they should, they fasted constantly, which means not doing, but eating what you should, or what you don't need. So there was obia, but then you get chorus. That means crammed full. Chorus when you're, when you're fat, and you've had, had too much, and you're ready to go, and then comes a terrible state. Things have been going so well with you, and you're so prosperous, you're doing so well, that the famous word, a word you all know here, is hubris. Hubris, presumption, high presumption. You're, you're responsible for your greatness. I have done this thing, you know, and, uh, and comes the vanity, which is fatal. And then comes the point of no return, which is 80. 80 is the God. That's when you do everything you can to get the, yourself off the stage. See, when, it's, when you reach the point when, the, when the, the villain or the hero, as the case may be, it's a heroic tragedy, you see, cannot be saved. Uh, the last word that uh, Clytemnestra speaks to, to, uh, uh, to uh, Oedipus is, 
You poor thing. This is the last, the only thing I can say to you. He's completely deluded. He thinks he's, his grandeur has gone to his head and so forth, and he won't take any counsel from anyone and so forth. He says, that's all I can say from here, all I ever will. She's finally seen the light, because that's eighty. At that point, you see, that's the point of no return, and you're finished. The only problem then is not to keep you lingering, because there's no point to keeping the suffering, continue the suffering. It doesn't have to go on forever and ever. That's terrible. So the problem is to get rid of you, and so you do it. You have a sort of fascination in which everything you do is the very thing that will accelerate your demise. You do all the wrong things, that you, and all the things that will get rid of you, the right things in this case, and that's called eighty. And we have, have we reached the stage of eighty? Here they've reached it, you know. The day God's grace is always extended, but what do you have here? This horrible statement, I saw that the day of grace was passed with them, both temporally and spiritually. They're not going to be able to get back on their feet economically or any other way. They go together. It's an awful statement. And then, for I saw thousands of them hewn down in open rebellion against their God and heaped up his dung. This mass destruction, we mentioned the ages of extermination we live in, how many thousands of acres are being destroyed of the world every minute, how every hundreds of species are disappearing every week and so forth. We're ringing down the curtain now. Everything is folding up. We're, this, is the, this is an age of extermination. There has been such things, and, and nothing makes this clearer than the Book of Mormon, and we get this to, when we get the Jaredites very soon, and the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. That's what they emphasize. See, we've been through this cycle before. It's not a single cycle, as everybody used to suppose, on the old linear evolutionary line. We just evolve and we progress. Oh, no, you don't. You periodically collapse and then you go through the misery all over again because we, we all have to be tested by the same test. But they were heaped up as dung. Well, they, the nearest thing to that would be a nuclear situation. It has to be mass slaughter, but they were, they did uh, go crazy. They were wild about this. And then a terrible thing happens or something else happens. The Nephites try to disengage. You feel it here. The uh, uh, these fateful words. You ask the question, we've been asking the question all along, where is it all leading, you see? Well, this is the answer, the day of grace is better. When it's sumidie set una lectabla tempus, that's when Troy is just about to fall and the king says, well, this is the last day and the time we can never avoid. We can't avoid it anymore, it's, it's come, you see. Fuimus Troyes, we were Trojans. It's, we say, we put it this way today, now we're history, you see. We're history, well, we're soon to become history. Well, it would be nice if it was pleasant history, but there's reassurance here. We're being told this because there's a chance it doesn't have to happen again, though it will. Well, uh, the, uh, the Nephites try to disengage. A very thing, interesting thing is going to happen. They began to flee before the Lamanites to the land of Jason. Um, they've had enough of fighting the Lamanites just because they're Lamanites, or fighting the Nephites just because they're Nephites. The game of good guys and bad guys is, uh, doesn't make sense anymore. And the withdrawal becomes a rout here. And now they go to the city where Amoron had deposited the records up in the city, up in the city there, remember, of the, the city of the north, Shem, or Shem. I brought along for the benefit of Brother Hoosis. Yes, dictionary. On the name, they went to the hill Shim to the city Shim, you see. They're falling back toward the north, and uh, this is what we read in the dictionary. <laughs> Interruption. But I think it's worth it, because these little veristic touches in the Book of Mormon are really something. Here we are. Aha. Uh -huh. Sha, 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 here we are. Yeah. It gives us here, Shim, north, Fishamam, to the north, Shamam, in the north, Fishamam, northerly. Well, that's Shim, you see. And, of course, it could be, can be a straw, no, a strawberry's a different word. <laughs> Some milk here. But the point is, they go to the hill Shim, which was to the north, quite a ways, and they've been falling back, always toward the north and east, which has been the, that's their western frontier anyway. And they go to the place where Ammon hid the records, which he says in the hill Shim, up in the north. And behold, I'd gone according to the word of Amara and taken the plates of Nephi. Fifteen years had passed, he's now twenty-four years old, around there or so. And, uh, and upon the plates of Nephi made a full account where are these plates, we don't have them. These plates I did forbear to make a full account, for behold, 
This is why he's not going to harrow up our souls here with giving us the whole story after they disengage. The, uh, a full description of the, of the plates uh, uh, would be overdoing it. It would just make us sick. Uh, this is another powerful statement here when he says here. Behold, another one. I mean, they just, they just ring like uh, successive strokes of doom, don't they? This one now. Make a full account of all the wickedness and abomination because, for behold, a continual scene of wickedness and abomination has been before mine eyes ever since I have been sufficient to behold the ways of man. What a, what a powerful statement and how powerfully put to it. Because the interesting thing is, this used to sound like a very fanciful and climactic statement. Uh, the guy had some imagination. But just consider today how many adults can make that statement in Lebanon or in Ethiopia or in Afghanistan. I mean, people who have grown up are 24 years old, as he said, when you were about 24 years old, as Mormon, as Mormon was, or in Ethiopia or in Salvador or in Cambodia. You take a dozen places, Ireland for that matter, who spent all who've seen nothing all the days of their life but a continual scene of wickedness and abomination. In all those places, this continues. And our own inner cities, there are many young people who could say that. I've seen nothing but a continual sight of wickedness and abomination before our eyes. And so, I, he may have been sitting in, in front of the TV all that time. He would, could say the same thing. <laughs> nothing but a scene of crime and sex and big money and above all violence and murder all over the place. You know, we just love it. That, that's your prime TV. So it's a continual scene of wickedness since I was sufficient to behold the ways of man. The power with which Joseph expresses those things. My lad, the Book of Mormon is something, isn't it? So his heart is filled with sorrow, all because of their wickedness, all my days. He has not had a happy life, see. I say many people, 24, can make the same statement today. Uh, so they're driven north. No, here it, here it comes again, you see, in the 20th verse here. It came to pass, we were driven and driven, it came to pass, we were driven northward to the land which was called Shem. See, there's north and Shem again. There's your verse 20. Hmm? It's Semitic. It's basic Semitic and all Semitic claims. A Shemal, common Shemal is the left hand. A Shami is, is the old name for, for Damascus, the north city. And, uh, well, it still is, as a matter of fact. The Shemal is the north one, of course, when you're facing east. Uh, Yamin, the right hand, and so forth. Yes, it, it, it applies in Egyptian or almost any Semitic language. In this particular dictionary, this is a, a Lebanese dictionary. It's the Palestinian the Arabic that uh, Nephi's people would have spoken, being Transjordan people, you see, being uh, half Manasseh. We needn't go into that, but still he hits it again here that makes it, that it's, it's northward. And notice they're hunted and driven. It's a rout. These people, you'd be surprised they're going to come back and win the whole thing back again. Is this, are they in for a happy surprise, you see? It's never too late, you might say. They make a big stand uh, in the northern city of Shem, and then Mormon turns the tide in the 24th to 26 verses. My words did arouse them to vigor, and they did not flee. Their great leader uh, is able to turn the tide, and this has happened before. And they're with, but he's without hope. But the interesting thing is the military situation is not desperate. It's very much in their favor. They're going to win three big victories in a row now. They're going to take everything back, including the land desolation. They have no need for despair militarily, but that's not the problem, is it? When we're probably, when we're probably uh, properly armed and ready, marshaled for war, we've made our preparations, our Cold War preparations, on and on and on and on and on. Yeah, that's not the problem at all. That's not going to solve the thing, you see. That wasn't the issue. And notice in the 27th verse, they actually conquer everything. We, we did go forth against the Nephites and the robbers of Gandian until we'd again take possession of the lands of our inheritance. The whole works. This certainly makes Mormon the greatest general in the, in the Book of Mormon, it? the things he's able to do. And uh, the Lamanites and the, and the Gadiantans, the bad guys, were willing to accept a treaty, which was good for eight years, it says here. And, uh, they were able, willing to accept terms in a treaty. And uh, we get the lands of our inheritance divided. And this, is, was this, this was the agreement, you see, that in the 29th verse, a settlement that the lands to the north of the narrow pass uh, were to belong to the Lamanites, the Nephites. They fled up there, so now they're there. They're going to keep that. 
And what divides them is a narrow pass. Now, the Isthmus of Panama is not a narrow pass. It's 20 miles wide. We're talking about the great narrow passes, which are, allow either side to control it, you see. The Nephites could stop the Lamanites there. The Lamanites could stop the Nephites there. The ideal place to make the boundary for, for the treaty here. When you think of pass, you think of the famous passes, like the Cilician Gates or the Khyber Pass or the... Or the, the uh, the Cassiai Porta, the Caucasian Gates, or the St. Gothard, or Echo Canyon here, as far as that goes, there can, or Cumberland Gap, or Thermopylae. There are passes, narrow passes that control history. They played great passes. And uh, the Hispus of Panama is not one of them, you see. Let's not get into the Book of Mormon geography. There was a pass somewhere where they could control it, see. The narrow, the narrow passage was the one that the Nephites or Lamanites uh, could hold. And, of course, it's the best possible place to secure by treaty, which we t learn at the beginning of the next chapter here. So, the land south belongs to the Lamanites, the land north belongs to the Nephites, and there's a pass between them which can be controlled by both. And Khyber Pass, you see. And then the next chapter, ten years. Ten years of preparation and Cold War now. After all, after a victory like that, they have good chances, you know. But without repentance. We'll get them this time, you see, the Cold War. Until ten years more had passed away, preparing against the time of battle. Cold War, that's what we do. We'll get, we'll get more missiles than they get. We're preparing the, the big thing, you know. And uh, then the king of the Lamanites sends his challenge. He sends a formal, formal challenge in the, in the fourth verse. Well, what goes on? Well, the thing is, you should use the time repenting, but of course they had no intention of doing that. Crying to this people, repent, ye baptize, build up my church, and ye shall be spared. It's never too late here. He withdrawn his spirit. He, he thought the, the day of grace was past with him, but there's still the Lord holds out his, his hand to us. But it was vain. He said they wouldn't listen. He gave them a chance for repentance. That's what he calls it, a chance for repentance. And behold, they did harden their hearts. They didn't take it. Because of the victory, they thought they could do it themselves. They thought it was a military problem, as we do today. The king of the Lamanites sent an epistle to me, which gave me to show that they were preparing to come against him. Now that's the chivalric manner of warfare, which is throughout the ancient world, especially you'll notice in the Book of Ether. But here, it is all strictly according to form. It's a, it's a formal challenge, a tradition, ancient one. Well, it's down still. General Taylor, who commanded the 101st Devour Division, he was the old school. He was the old heroic do and dash, sword in hand sort of guy. So uh, the first objective was to take Carantan, whom we held up for a whole week. Uh, in Carantan. So he says, I, I respect uh, the colonel who's defending Carantan. I, I want to invite him to tea and congratulate him. Jim was called him the last gentleman. So I was commissioned to take a white flag and go over and invite the colonel to come and have tea with General Taylor before we, before we blasted them out. <laughs> we couldn't blast them because they blasted us out. It was back and forth, back and forth at Carantan. And uh, they called it off at the last minute, but he was determined that he'd get the other gentleman. Well, that's the heroic way of doing it. That's the chivalric way of doing it. That's the chess game. That's the idea of battle, you see, in 17th century, 18th century, when uh, Prince Eugene or Bernadotta would be on one side one day, one year, and the other side the next, giving them his advice and counsel as a professional. So he sends him this, uh, he sends him terms. So throughout this, you notice the, the Nephites always are given a choice. They're given a chance. Can't we talk about this? Can't we do something about this? The Lord is lengthening it out as long as he can. He's giving us as much a rope as possible. And they're going to hang themselves on it just as sure as anything. And, uh, of course, the, notice in the fifth verse, of course, the narrow pass, my people did gather themselves together in the land of desolation, which was near the narrow pass. Well, desolation goes with it. It's a place of battle. It's a place of war. It's a place not being found or de uh, farmed or densely occupied. It's a good defense zone is what it is, you see. But land desolation, that's the old word horma or horeb. Harma, it's the word for, for war. Uh, da, da, the uh, Muslims divide the world in, into, uh, into the ahl, the uh, salam, the, the Dal Salam, the, the pacified world, which is except Salam, and the Dar al-Harb, the people of the world dedicated to war and destruction. And that's what they do when they conquer. See? So this was, you get a very good picture. See, here's the pass here, the desolate country around there. They'd fought lots of wars there. It's the natural place for battle. There are such places in Europe. As you know, I mentioned those passes, all, every one of which has been the scene of many battles. And so here we go. He sent an epistle that they were preparing to come to battle again. 
Well, my people gathered themselves in desolation and fortified themselves with all their force and beat them. That was sensible because they were on the defensive. First rule of Clausewitz, first rule of war, always be on the defensive. The defensive always has the stronger side. And almost, that's a general rule. You might find some exceptions to that, but not with Clausewitz. You, won't. He says, you always have the advantage, and Mormon will tell us what happens there and, and why they lost later on. Well, they beat them, and the eighth verse, they beat them again. A great victory now, so they a great number of them. Now here's two victories in a row. The Nephites are doing all right. Uh, Mormon was wrong all along here. And they decided they're unbeatable now because of this great thing, and revenge becomes the motive. Now because of this great thing, they began to boast their own strength and began to swear before the heavens that they would avenge themselves of the blood of their brethren who had been slain by their enemies. Here is the standard scenario of the Western, of course. The bad guys do bad things for the first half and the good guys get revenge for the second half. And we love that revenge, catching up with them, shooting them, blowing them up and so forth and so on. That is the main theme, you see. The, uh, uh, the revenge, the Green Beret motif, you see. Uh, John Wayne or somebody is the good guy and he doesn't want war or anything like that and then they do something very, very bad and then the thing we all sit on the edge of our seats and relish is the revenge that follows. See? Because innocent people have suffered and so forth and the night, he's not Mr. Nice, you're not Mr. Nice Guy anymore, then you really land with it. And this is a theme of countless uh, uh, police stories and detective stories and uh, westerns and so forth, where Mr. Good Guy goes up and cleans up the bad guy, but only after he's been driven to the extreme and he has to avenge the blood of his brother. Well, now, how about this noble motive of, of avenging the, the, uh, the blood of your brother, the private eye plot, the police whose pal gets shot and so forth? Uh, this is not the avenging the blood of your brethren, uh, an ideal, isn't it an, isn't it an obligation? They made, when they started winning, they made it a big thing. That's what they were going to do. And they did swear by the heavens, and know they're very religious about this, for God and country, kill a gook for God and so forth, as they used to say this. They did swear by the heavens and by the throne of God that they would go up to battle against their enemies and cut them off from the face of the land. Finally, they're going to settle the Lamanite question once for all. A big battle because they've got them on the run now. Oy, 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 they shouldn't have done that. Uh, and so, from that time on, Mormon says, I was through. Now, here was their greatest general, the great hero, the one, the one that had won the battles and so forth. Uh, this was the ultimate folly, the last straw. The leader renounces his commission. The Lamanites were still wicked, but wicked men can never be on the right side, including ourselves. He becomes a conscious, conscientious, conscientious objector, you see. It's not the side you're on at all, after all. We said for years, uh, Noriega's an SOB, Noriega's a, a murderer and a thug, but he's our murderer and a thug. We used him, you see. He's a villain, but he's our villain. And the side you're on makes a difference. Well, it doesn't at all. He's, it's, it's equally. Notice he's, he's said it twice. Lamanites, Nephites, nothing to choose between them. They were equally bad. He says, I had led them, notwithstanding their wickedness, I had led them many times, the great-hearted, Mormon, why? Because I loved them. He says, I had to do it, according to the love of God which is in me with all my heart. My soul had been poured out in prayer unto God all the day long for them. Nevertheless, it was without faith because of the hardness of their hearts. Not going to do anything without faith. Here, Mormon was the true hero. He was the true patriot, but he would not say, my country right or wrong. My country may it always be right, but my country right or wrong. He wouldn't say that. As soon as they were wrong, he says, I laid down commission. I became a conscientious objector, an idle onlooker. I didn't have any part of it, he says. Uh, he went all out to make it right, but uh, what can you do without faith? He says he had no faith here. What other wisdom have we written down here? Um, so he gave them three chances here. Thrice have I delivered them out of the hands of their enemies, and they have repented not of their sins. They didn't get the point at all. But then when they reached the point that they swore by all that had been forbidden by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that they would go up unto their enemies to battle to avenge themselves of the blood of their brethren, and I repeat, what can be a loftier, more noble ideal than avenging yourselves in the manner of Rambo for the blood of your brethren? That's the theme we're all wrapped up in today, and this, he says, is going to wipe them out. This is what they should never have done, you see because it's been forbidden, vengeance is mine, the Lord says, and I will repay. And from that time, he says, I did utterly refuse to go up against my enemies. He wouldn't fight at all. Well, well, it's very serious when, uh, when the general won't fight, you see. The, uh, 
then, well, then we should, he, he becomes the conscientious objector here. And what's he do? He becomes an idle witness. He becomes a reporter now. He's going to report the whole thing for our benefit, an observer for our benefit. And uh, so it must somehow apply. If, if this, this is the work he does. I just stand as an idle witness to manifest unto the world the things by idle. He means he's not busy. He's busy taking notes, but he's not fighting, you see. Unto the world the things which I saw and heard according to the manifestations of the Spirit to testify things to come. Therefore I write unto you Gentiles, aha, it is addressed to us, we're the Gentiles on the land, and also unto you house of Israel, when the work shall commence, ye shall be about to prepare to return. Remember how the house of Israel shall be judged. This is what the issue is. It has nothing to do with all this fighting back and forth such as you find in Israel today. He writes for all of Israel in the last days. Uh, you do not divide into armies as good people and bad people. There is no dark side and bright side. Uh, read this verse. Where is these verses 17 to 19 very carefully here where it says, These things, this the Spirit manifests. Well, what's the end of it all? What's it all getting to? And why is he telling us this is it, you see? The issue is entirely something totally different from all this. All this is just a distraction. This is Satan's way of engaging ourselves and getting ourselves committed here because ironically, this is the thing you must be thinking about. You must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every soul, back to the old individualism that's so strong, you know, in Third Nephite, every individual for himself, every soul who belongs to the whole human family of Adam, and you must stand to be judge of your works, whether they be good or bad, every individual. And that's the real issue, <laughs> not which side is winning and all this glory, flag waving, drum beating, and so forth and so on. You're going to get that way. And that you also may believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and also the Jews shall have another witness. So this is the, these verses. Of, you cannot claim a reward for being on one side or the other. We say we need an enemy, so that America needs an enemy, and he has to be the embodiment of evil so that we can go on being the good guys without having to repent. But no one mentions that word repent. That's a naughty word. You lose any election if you mention it, believe me. So we come to the next sad chapter. And the Nephites take the offensive now. Things are going to turn up now, you see. They haven't stopped winning yet. The Nephites, the 363rd year, the Nephites did go up with their armies to battle against the Lamanites out of the land. And the, uh -oh, the, Nephi, the Nephites were driven back, and while they were weary, a fresh army of Lamanites came upon them. The Lamanites took the city of desolation back again. So here, this is seesaw war. They're winning it back again. And so what the Nephites do is cons consolidate, naturally, and uh, the remainder to join the inhabitants of the city of Teancum, now they're, using, now they're using a silly system of check dams, so to speak. They have a check dam which doesn't need to hold back much water, but will hold back enough, and then another check dam and so forth. The only thing is if you have an exceptional rain, one check dam breaks, and that compounds the rush of water on the next, which was not built to, to contain that. So that's overrun. Once the, check, the top check or any of them breaks, oops, the whole thing is wiped out. And this is what happens here. They started checking things this way. They dig in, they, the remainder did flee and join the inhabitants of the city of Tiancum so that when Tiancum fell, it had been a bigger calamity than any, ever. And here's the fable for our time. I say this is the number one principle of our, our good friend Clausewitz here. Never, never do the foolish thing of going up if you don't have to, absolutely. The aggressors, Deuteronomy 2, 5, and 17 are very good there. Because the armies of, it was because the armies of the Nephites went up unto the Lamanites that they began to be smitten. For if it were not for that, the Lamanites could have had no power over them. But they took the aggression and went over. They had to punish the Nephites. We were halfway through the, through the Korean War, and uh, there was peace in the air and so forth. And, and one of our generals said, we have not punished them enough. We must continue the war so we can punish them well. The Lord says here, Behold, the judgments of God will overtake the wicked. They'll be punished all right. And it is by the wicked that the wicked are punished. They'll be punished all right, but it will be. Don't pray that you won't be the punisher of anyone, because it's by the wicked that the wicked are punished. Or it's the wicked that stir up the hearts of the children of men unto bloodshed. The, uh, these things are really, uh, we, we talked about, I just noticed a, here, do I have it here? I better not find it. It's a pretty unpleasant thing. Yeah, here it is. Nope. That's about the Dead Sea Scroll. 
Oh, that's what about eleven and something. No, I'm rather glad. I, I'm rather glad it isn't in here. It's a recent uh, news item that is most disturbing. I had it. Well, I won't look for it. I hope I won't find it. But uh, here, oh, it's too sad. The, uh, now here, in the eighth verse, we get a third victory for the Nekites. They take possession of the city of Teancum, and it came to pass that they were repulsed and driven back by the Nephites. And when the Nephites saw that they had driven the Lamanites, they did again boast of their strength. And they went on and took possession of desolation again. They've got it back again. They've lost it. They've tried, they got it back again. Back and forth it goes. This is one of these, like, they would fight many. The first day of the Battle of Patient, wasn't it, that how many? 600,000 men were killed, something like that. It was absolutely fabulous, and they gained about 40 yards. That's the kind of, of, of generalship we had, and, and it still did well. And so they took everything back and took possession of the city of desolation. And the Lamanites came again, and against them, back and forth, and the Nephites repented not of the evil they had done, but perished in their wickedness continually, and it's impossible for tongue to describe, for man to write a perfect description of the horrible scene of blood and carnage which was among the people. Every heart was hardened that they delighted in the shedding of blood. And that's the one I, that, uh, that note I had here, I said just as well, I don't. Delighting in the shedding of blood. Well, I've known men, a uh, General Johnson, he became a general at the age of 25, can you imagine that? He delighted in the shedding of blood, and of course that got him the promotions and so forth, but he didn't last long. He was too proud to duck. That was the end of him. Uh, standing on a, on a dike one day with General Taylor. Everybody else fell flat, but not General Johnson. He stood proudly and <laughs> finished him off. <coughs> and talk about Achilles in his tent. Taylor was rabid. For we couldn't approach him or anything else. He was so angry and upset. So here we go. It's going all right now. And uh, the, the fresh air, well, I skipped the wrong. Oh, here it is. It pops out right in this place. This is what makes me so sad. Uh, this is uh, from uh, less than a year ago. Uh, certain senators are uh, objecting to certain practices. His reaction stemmed from a photograph sent to him by parents of a man who graduated in August from the Marine Corps recruit depot at Paris Island. The eight inch by 10 inch color photograph was a formal platoon graduation picture showing the recruits standing at attention on risers with the officers who trained them in the foreground. Eight of the men held four hand painted signs bearing pictures and slogans. One showed a naked woman, another a skull and crossbones, with the words, kill, rape, pillage, burn. This is what they graduated to. And there, there are people that like that sort of The night of June the 6th, the invasion, at Ramsgate, General Johnson gave an address. He, he jumped, he screamed up on the stage with a trench mouth, a trench mouth, <laughs> with a trench knife in his mouth. And he said, do you see this knife? Before the night is over, it will be wet with German blood. And then he let out the most hideous rebel yell you ever heard. Well, the people that go in for that sort of thing, and that's what we have here. He said, there never been greater wickedness among the children of Lehi. War as the supreme wickedness here. Ah, but the Lamanites start taking it back now, on the 13th. The Lamanites did take the city desolation. They take desolation back. How many times has desolation changed hands now? There are many cities like that. Also, marched forward against the city of Tiancum and did drive the inhabitants out of it, took many prisoners of war, both women and children, and offered them up as sacrifices unto their idol gods. Now, this we're already getting in, we mentioned in their, in their religion, into the Mesoamerican, Mayan, and especially Aztec uh, practice of mass sacrifice of prisoners on a tremendous scale. They did it to the point where it reduced the population so much. The, uh, there's some very interesting studies made on that recently. At the drop of a hat, prisoners had to be sacrificed, and not just a sacrifice, a symbolic once in a while, then it became an orgy, became an orgy of blood. And they, that's what they used their, their, for, their sacred towers for after that, the Mayans had built them up. Sacrifice them to their idol gods. 
That's what they did. They were already moving into the Mesoamerican horrors there. Well, this made the, this was a real outrage. The Nephites certainly have a righteous rage here in verse 15. They had a right to be mad at this, righteous anger. Nephi wins again, and they have eight years of peace after all that. Well, this goes on and on. See, they could repent any time here. But now, this is a very, another one of those statements that, in which the Book of Mormon, as a language, as, as an epic, as epic writing, achieves real heights, that refuse the, the lofty expression, the, the four conditions that Matthew Arnold says that are found only in Homer, you find in, in writings in the Book of Mormon here. The, the nobility, the speed, the loftiness, the simplicity and directness of language, he says. You, you find that only in Homer, but you find it in the Book of Mormon too. When he says, and from this time forth, the Nephites did gain no power over the Lamanites, but began to be swept off by them, even as the dew before the sun. Now, in this, I talked about this age of extermination, and that's what happens. Whole species, I say, whole areas of the world, whole populations are suddenly just melting away like the dew before the sun. Uh, they haven't been attacked by anything in particular violence except big corporations and their exploitations and armies and a few things like that, and plagues, and lots of famine and the like. But we don't pay much attention to it. It happens here, it happens there, and they began to just disappear even as the dew before the sun, and great institutions. And, and uh, we start out with big, some of you may have seen yesterday that thing about the, the, the Valdez uh, Exxon. Uh, they started out doing everything right, but they just got lax in all regards, and everybody just, well, let go. Nothing can happen, and they, they paid no attention to the, to the lanes, they paid no attention to the ice, they, the Coast Guard stopped giving signals, they could, have, they could have set up more radars, but it was expensive, so they didn't. All sorts of things they could have done, and they just didn't care. And the captain was asleep or drunk, it made no difference. Only one man on the deck of this enormous ship, the biggest city in them, and they're all overworked. A, a small crew, because it saved money. If anyone got sick, there was no one to take his place and so forth. The whole thing, well, there's no villain there or anything, it's just... As I mentioned before, uh, I'd like to read you from some of the Roman satirists on why they collapsed. But the, it's generally agreed that this is what happened, you see. Uh, all the old studies end up the same way. Idris Bell calls it a fatty degeneration of the intellect. Rostov says, so these are men who spent years. I used to talk an awful lot about the decline and fall of Rome. That was my own special study. Uh, and why? Well, uh, Rostov said they just couldn't think of anything new. They couldn't think of anything. It was just the same old stuff. And of course, I've written some things on rhetoric and the like, the effect that public relations had on crippling, changing values, making people feel secure when there's no security or anything else, but playing, playing it with uh, smoke and mirrors and words is what you're doing with the, the very highly developed study, public relations gimmicks, which are better than ours today even, and it's destroyed the ancient world. So it goes, but it's just not in a way, it's what happens. You can't point to one particular villain and, uh, or one particular person who was lax or this, that, and the other. It, it, well, look, uh, in one month the Nazis ruled Europe, and the next month what had happened to them? No one would ever admit being a Nazi. They just gone. They just faded away. We just marched down to Berchter's Garden. I went in Berchter's Garden. The, cup, the, the coffee was still warm in the cups where where um, Martin Borman had skipped out the back door. And uh, we went into Berchter's Garden. These people didn't. They suddenly appeared uh, respectable. Most of the worst villains were working for us because they had inside information, could help us out, things just that and the other. Everything was stolen, everything was plundered, everybody scattered in all directions. The long line at Pileville in Paris of officers cashing in money for loot, things that shouldn't be done. Everybody was doing what shouldn't be done. Well, this is what happens. They just begin to be swept off as the dew before the sun, all going to melt away. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. The whole thing is going to melt like an iceberg, you see. Not too fast. Well, again the Lamanites come and beat the Nephites in the 19th verse, and they fled again to the city of Boaz. And uh, uh, what do we do here? No, not that sort of thing. We're in the fourth chapter here. And the, uh, the second time the Nephites were driven and slaughtered with exceeding great slaughter. And the women, women and children, now the sacrifice. What do we do with these people? Well, we sacrifice them and make a virtue of it. And that's what they did. 
And it came to pass the Nephites did again flee before them, taking with them all the inhabitants with them, both in towns and villages. So the migration has become a route. Everybody has joined in it. And uh, it's an irresistible rush when they come. People pushing baby buggies, hauling wagons, cars break down and so forth, carrying things on their back, old, old junk, carrying grandfather clocks and things like People do the strangest thing when they, when they evacuate. And notice where they're going. I, Mormon, went to the hill Shim and did take up all the records which are Mormon did. Well, now, hiding the records was a sign that things were over. They have to be held. Now it's time to, to hide them and move them. He's going to move them to Camorra, where they're going to get, end up, I'm sure. The hill Shim and take up all the records. But this is far up in the north here. Well, then, here's a remarkable thing about uh, Mormon. After all that, the great heart of Mormon, a truly tragic figure. He's larger than life here, he says. I did go forth among the Nephites. I did repent of the oath. Here he took an oath that he'd never go and fight again because the Lord had forbidden him to seek revenge. He said he took an oath, but he broke it. His love for his people was so great. He talked about a hero and so forth. I would no more, I had made an oath that I would no more assist him. They gave me a command of their armies. They trust him, the last man they trust. Here's a man we can finally trust. Mormon will solve it. He's, he's pulled us out before. He'll get us out again. A la Napoleon. See, we can, the French rallied to him again and again, and he pulled them out more than once. He, you know that. As though I could deliver them from their afflictions. As though I was the one who could save them. Very flattering and so forth. But, behold, notice again, now here is the essence of, of a tragedy. The fact that you but there is no hope here. I was, it was without hope, you see. He does the hero, the heroic, he, he does the thing which he knows is, he's devoted to a lost cause. He dies for the cause, he knows it's not going to do any good, and yet he does it for the people. The truly heroic figure, you see. It was without hope, for I knew that the judgments of the Lord which had come upon them, for they repented not. The last minute they could have repented, but they won't repent. And uh, I say repent is a dirty word in our language. We don't use it at all. So, but did struggle for their lives without calling upon that being who created them. And I said before, you tend not to. So they flee to the city of Jordan, driven back. They didn't take the city at that time. He sets up a defense in depth that had worked so very well by Moroni. He invented the defense in depth, you know, which is very effective. It came to pass, they did come up against us to maintain, we did maintain the city. There were also other cities which we maintained, and he fights strongholds, the same way to cut them out. We, we won't go into the strategy of that, but it was invented by Moroni. It was very effective, and it was the only thing that could stop a blitzkrieg in World War II, could stop it. the armored divisions, could defense in depth, where you had these, they couldn't bypass you and leave you. They'd have to take each one, that slowed them down, you see, and made all the difference. And it came to pass that whatsoever lands we passed by, the inhabitants thereof were not gathered in, were destroyed by the Lamanites. This is a route, uh, a migration in size. 1939-1945, the Russians retreated all the way from Central Europe, clear back, you know, to Stalingrad, all the way back there. Half of Europe, enormous cotton was evacuated. They fell back all the time, back, 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 and so forth. And they burned, it was black earth. They burned the towns, they burned the villages. This has been done before. Their towns and their villages and cities were burned. Well, it's been done in the siege of Moscow. That's the way they stopped Napoleon, as you know. Napoleon got there with a the blitzkrieg, but then he couldn't get back because there was nothing to live on. They destroyed, they destroyed the crops, they burned the villages and so forth. This is what they've done here. And uh, Joseph knows a lot about these things, this Joseph Smith. And so, so great were their numbers that they did tread the people of the Nephites under their feet, hopelessly outnumbered here. It's, this is something out of Star Wars. 380th year, the Lamanites did come against us to battle, and we did stand against them boldly, but it was in vain. So great were their numbers that they did tread the people of the Nephites under their feet. It really had epic dimensions, does it? So they, all they could do was run again. They took the flight, and the whole thing was sauf qui peut. The person who can go fastest is the only one who will save every man for himself now. Whoso flight was swifter than the Lamanites could escape. That was it. The only, you had only one object. Every man for himself, get out as fast as you can. Just run. Well, they're not going to win any wars anymore. They're not going to check them anymore. They had escaped those whose flight did not exceed the Lamanites, were swept down and destroyed. They were run over, like a tank division coming up behind them. Uh, and then now I am a more. I don't desire to harrow up the souls of men with such an awful scene of love and carnage anymore. This is enough. Haven't I told you enough? 
knowing that these things must surely be made known, uh, or you're doomed to repeat them. But the same thing is this, if we ignore the lessons of history, we're doomed to repeat them. These things must be made known. Why should these awful things be made known and be made known unto us? As Brother Benson says, it's particularly for us in our time. Well, that must be very, very relevant, so we must pay very close attention here. What can we do about it? He's going to tell us what he can do about it. Knowing that these things must surely be made known. And also a knowledge of these things must come to a remnant of these people unto the Gentiles. Uh, and now we come to an amazing passage here. Unto these, and this is going to what the Gentiles are going to do. Unto the Gentiles, who the Lord said, should scatter this people, and this people should be counted as not among them. How they treated the Indians. And this is what happens. The Indians are very strong. They're half the inhabitants of the continent in Joseph Smith's day. But this is what's going to happen. Therefore, I write a small abridgment, daring not to give a full account of the things which I've seen because of the commandment, that you might have too great sorrow. If I told you the whole thing, it would cripple you. It would, it would weaken your hands, as the, as the uh, Lakish letters say in the time of Lehi. The prophet's saying, telling people too many things, it weakens their hands. They become slack and helpless. It has a paralyzing effect. I want to tell you too much, he says, that you might not have too great sorrow. It would cripple you. But I speak unto their seed and also to the Gentiles. I know that such will sorrow for the calamity of the house of Israel. Yea, they will sorrow for the destruction of this people. They will sorrow that this people had not repented, that they might have been clasped into the arms of Jesus. Now these things are written unto a remnant of the house of Jacob. These are the Indians you hear there. They are written after this manner because it is known of God that wickedness will not bring them forth. They will, because of wickedness they will not come forth. They are to be hid up unto the Lord. And this is the commandment I have received. I am not going to give these records just to anybody. They shall go unto the unbelieving of the Jews, and for this intent they shall go that they may be persuaded to believe in Jesus Christ. And you get the strong impression that Jews, if I know any Jews, I am part Jew myself, uh, they are not going to accept it until they have got a good beating too. They are going to, oh boy. Because after all, well, they're in a in very bad condition right now, you see, not only outnumbered, have extremely difficult problem to solve. And what are they going to do? They must be brought low, apparently, and this is what it tells us here. This intent that they shall be persuaded that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that the Father may bring about through his most beloved, his purpose in restoring the Jews or all the house of Israel unto the land of their inheritance. That one back there and this one here, as far as the inheritance goes. So there's going to be more rough house ahead. We can be sure of that. For this people shall be scattered and become a dark and filthy and loathsome. I won't be able to read it. I had a, something really hot I brought along here. But. For this people shall be scattered and shall become a dark, filthy and loathsome. Now this again is, is common term that is, is not race at all. It has nothing to do with ethnic. This is a term that is used in the prose it's, uh, anciently to, uh, to describe, well, you say a, a dark, filthy, you can talk about a, a kike or a yid or a, or a wop or a dagos, things like that. They are described in the same terms. And they, this people shall become a dark, filthy, loathsome people beyond the description of that which has been among us even that which has been among the Lamanites. They shall be driven out as chaff before the wind. 1832, the various things that happened, you know, the things that happened, the great march, the, uh, the march of tears, the, the trail of tears of the, uh, from Florida into the Oklahomas and so forth that happened under President Jackson in 1832. They were once a delightsome people. See, delightsome, that's what they were. See, delightsome, and all men are cultivated and desirable. It has nothing to do with race or anything like that, to be delightsome. Led about by Satan, but now they are led about by Satan, even as chaff is driven before the wind. They have no purpose, no direction, no control. They do, they follow their lusts and their lists, and they do what they want to, as Satan leads them about like chaff before the wind. Behold, the Lord hath reserved their blessings they might have received for the Gentiles. And at that point, we'll grind to a dead stop, because there's something we want to say the next time before we get to the Jaredites. But uh, be of good cheer. The mere fact that this is given to us shows that there is hope. There's hope for somebody. You'll be sure of that. Well, remember this. <laughs>